Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Lennon Families Committee meeting. Um, have we any apologies? Wallace, please. Uh, we have one substitution. Uh, Councillor Ian James is substituting for Councillor Pogali. I believe he's online. Yeah, that's it for today. Thank you, Wallace. Um, do we have any declarations of interest from members? All good, thank you. And there are some minutes that we need to agree. Um, you can see them there on the agenda. It's the minute of meeting from the executive sub of 22nd of April, the Children, Young People and Families Partnership of 1st of March, the GNCT of 4th of March. And can we agree all those minutes, the relevant people that were on the committees? Uh, Councillor Barrett. I, I, I know the feeling, Liz, so don't, don't, Councillor Barrett, so don't worry about it too much. Councillor Cuthbert. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, do outstanding business uh, statements also form part of the minutes if they're? Uh, I don't know. I will ask our, our Clark team, though. Sorry, I didn't catch Councillor Cuthbert what your question was. Yeah, I just wondered if outstanding business statements form part of the minute or whether they were not approved in the same way as the minute. We, we list them separate on the agenda, so we, we approve the minutes first and then we move on to the outstanding business statement, take any updates and then agree um, to note the outstanding business statements. Sorry, I meant the outstanding business statements of the other groups, the other committees. No, they only get reported to those particular committees. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, can we agree all the minutes? Thank you. And we will now move on to aforementioned business statement. Uh, Wallace, please. Going first, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Um, can we and I'll take the first part of this um, just in relation to a couple of updates since our discussions at the last meeting. Um, so again, just in relation to the, the committee members and our teacher representatives, um, Tim Cairns, who is the secondary representative, has officially resigned from the committee and there'll be a timetable and information will be circulated shortly where we plan to hopefully have a result in time for the next um, committee meeting on the 23rd of October uh, where we have a further teacher um, for appointment. Just in relation to the previous discussion around the youth representatives, following further discussions um, with staff in both children, families and justice and also education and learning, um, as well as yourself, convener, Officers would continue to propose that rather than have fixed members of the Youth Forum attend meetings of this committee, um, regardless of the time or location, over and above their time given to be members of the Youth Forum, it would be more meaningful to have more informal engagement with the Youth Forum members out with the committee meetings. This is based on the feedback from the youth members themselves. Again, we would propose that an engagement plan was developed involving yourself, convener, and the vice conveners and representatives of the Youth Forum, with updates then being brought to this committee. As I mentioned previously, this is over and above the statutory engagement that already takes place. Thanks. Um, thank you, Scott. I mean, I, th I think just what I would add to that is I did have a word with Brian Hutton and his, his team about it. They, he does feel that that's the best way to engage, but I think it's really important to point out that it won't just be myself and the conveners team here that will be invited to these meetings. This will be the whole committee will be perfectly welcome to attend and, and put their tuppence worth in and, and answer questions if they so wish. Um, it, it, just, it does feel that, that, that if we're to get proper engagement from youth reps, it does feel this is the best way to do it. However, um, I will welcome any comment or, or question with regards to that. At this point, if members want to. Uh, Provost, please, you have a question. Um, thanks, Convener. I think you've um, preempted to a degree my question, which was going to be uh, around uh, the involvement of others beyond the uh, convenership uh, group being able to speak because I think it's quite important for, for the rest of the committee. I know from my own point of view, I find it very valuable to hear um, the views of young people who are uh, particularly still in education, given the topic of the committee, obviously, um, and to hear those voices. So I would find it um, unhelpful to lose that contact entirely. I think it is appropriate that we look to uh, 
meet young people on their terms. But I think that also can change from year to year about which youth reps are elected. Some may, as we have had in the past, be quite happy to come along to committee and want that to the table. That option should remain there um, if they so wish it. Um, but in other years, it is flexible to uh, adjust and that we have that as an ongoing dialogue with the youth forum um, depending on the year. So I would be keen that we leave the option open that they can come to committee if they wish. Um, but actually that we will continue to you know, look at how best to engage with them and not just with them, but actually with young people in general to gather those views. So um, if that can be reflected. Yeah, thanks, Provost. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the type of engagement we're speaking here about here, which I think will be really important, will not preclude any member of this committee and neither will it preclude youth reps coming to the formal meetings should they so wish. Um, if, we're, if we're OK and all that, I think we we also have a, a verbal update on parent council representatives. Uh, I don't know if Scott or Wallace, you're going to speak to that as well, please. Uh, thank you, Convina. Uh Probably just bring your attention on page 23. There's a brief update for members with regards to the parent rep appointment. So we sought uh, nominations from the primary and secondary school parent councils for two vacancies on the committee, uh, one for a representative obviously on the primary sector and the second on the secondary. And in total, we received three uh, nominations, one from primary and two from the secondary. And we had some interviews on the 24th, or 14th rather, 14th of August, uh, which, the convener uh, took part in and Councillor Shires, I believe she's about here somewhere. Uh, eventually we found two suitable candidates, which we are recommending here today. Uh, Miss Laverty from Meagle Primary School and Mr. R. Stubbs from Bredalbin Academy. So the committee is asked to agree the appointment of Ms. Laverty and Mr. Stubbs for the primary and secondary school appointments as the parent council reps on this committee. Thank you very much, Wallace. Um, Councillor Shires. Thank you, convener. I just want to say thank you very much um, for facilitating that and, and to Wallace for his support and to Ms Lafferty and the other uh, two people that were involved. It, it, I think calling it interviews is a bit, bit harsh and um, mm -hmm. I think it was a, a, a really positive um, engagement that reminded Councillor Rebick and I about the joys of being on parent councils mm -hmm. uh, in days gone by. Um, so it was really positive and, and we're delighted to um, to have had interest um, in parents because we, um, we really want to hear uh, your voices and, and the representation on behalf of the wider parent forum. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Shires, and, and I'm not sure whether it's more worrying for you and me, but uh, we did agree pretty much on, on everything that was said. And just before I formally um, welcome Amber, I better just make sure that we are we are happy to to approve that verbal update and that the the, the appointment of a parent council representatives is, is appropriate. So. Thank you, members. Thanks. Um, welcome, Amber. Uh, thanks very much for coming along today as well. I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and thanks very much, Councillor Shires, for, for your involvement in it. Thank you. Um, we will now move on to the, the first uh, <coughs> paper of substance today, which is the Perth and Kinross Education Improvement Plan, which is a real important paper and uh, will be in, it'll be introduced, as always, by our executive, our um, strategic leader, I should say now, um, Sheena Devlin. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce the Annual Education Service Improvement Plan. This plan requires um, to be submitted to the Scottish Government by the 30th of September, and it also must contain an update on progress against the national priorities that were set for 2023-24. 20, it should also provide the actions that we will take during this coming academic session from August 24 to June 25. Collaboration with stakeholders and a consideration of the local context is also required 
when we identify our improvement priorities. And this has been undertaken in a variety of ways, including discussion with head teachers during development sessions, a collation of all early learning and childcare and school improvement plans submitted in June. And there has also been collaboration with parents on actions which relate to mental health, to poverty and child protection. Much of this work is done through the um, meetings that we hold with the chairs of the parent councils and of course individually in schools between staff in schools and their parent councils. This year's plan includes progress against our three year stretch aims which were set in 2023 and we also are required to report this annually to the Scottish Government. The key achievements against our commitments from last year's plan include improvements in literacy and numeracy in all areas at all levels and also in the number of 16 to 19 year olds participating in education, employment or training. Senior phase, that's S4 to S6 attainment data in particular, the increase in tariff points for our care experienced school leavers also demonstrates positive progress. We have shared a high level presentation which all members of committee should have received, which outlines the person can roast performance in SQA results. A more detailed analysis, analysis of this will of course follow when we have the complete set of data relating to all qualifications that are achieved by our young people. But I would just want to highlight some of the headlines relating to the SQA results thus far, which include, we have doubled the number of course awards at National 2 and National 3 since 2019. And due to more ambitious presentation, we have more A to C passes at National 5 at higher and advanced higher than in session 22-23. And our National 5 and our higher pass rates are well above the national average. And for both of those, we are ranked fifth out of 32 local authorities, which represents a significant improvement. And although we have made progress in reducing the poverty related attainment gaps, significant differences in outcomes do still remain between those from our most and our least deprived communities and between those in key priority groups and their peers. Attendance figures remain a concern, particularly in secondary, and this will continue to be an area of significant focus in the year to come following on from the attendance seminars that we held last session. The rise in numbers of children and young people with additional support needs and the increasing complexity of those requires all of us working in education to work collaboratively to address barriers to learning. And priorities identified through stakeholder engagement are being taken forward through the Additional Support Needs Transformation Project. The education plan has identified the priorities and actions that aim to address these areas and that will drive the work of all early learning and childcare and schools for the coming session. Convener, there are a range of officers here from Education and Learning who are happy to take any questions from the committee on this report. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sheena. I, I suspect we will get a question or two here, but just before I um, ask for questions, I, I should have said at the start that although we have the formal method of putting cues in the, in the box, if the technology is not working, it's a small enough cohort of elected members here just wave at me and we'll see what we can do. Um, and if we have lots of questions and we need to do a, a comfort break at some point before the next paper, then we will do that. So um, we'll go to questions now, please. As as usual custom, if members have more than one question, we'll do one question and then give everybody a chance to ask a question and come back to you in due course if that's OK. But the first question we're going to have is from Bailey Hearn, please. Thank you very much, convener. My first question is on uh, the paragraph about staff reporting of behaviours in schools on page 45 of the pack. Um, the first paragraph there talks about the number of instances in schools, except for the very last line, which then starts talking about the individual children and young people. And it's saying there that there's um, it, the number of children and young people involved equates to just under 1% of the school population with 83% of the children and young people involved having additional support needs. What it doesn't mention in there is, and we well know that some people with additional support needs, multiple instances are relating to that, and it doesn't actually state there. Yes, there might be 
of the one percent being caused by um, children and young people, but it doesn't actually state there roughly what percentage of those instances are multiple to individual um, young people, and that may skew the figures a bit. I think that's a fair point. Um, I don't know if I don't know if, if it's fair to come to you to that, Fiona, or not. But thank you. Um, so many, some of those young people will have had more than one incident, um, and we take care in terms of being able to to look at that. And there are always, in every term, more incidents than the number of children and young people that are actually directly involved. Um, so. It's the two the two things are looked at on a regular basis so that we're really clear um, where we're seeing um, children and young people where they have multiple um, incidents, then their situations are looked at in more detail so that we can ensure that the planning and support that's, that's provided for them um, is continuing to be appropriate and, and addressing the needs. What we also do is look um, to track those young people who have got multiple incidents in one term. And what we are able to do then is to see whether over time that the number of incidents that are experienced are coming down um, as we would expect them to do because we've got the planning in place. Does that help? Uh, just before I come back, uh, Councillor Bailey, I'll bring in Sheena first if that's OK. I think the point it is is an important one, Bailey Hearn, because I know that in um, other fora we uh, we have that information that does say, you know, of the number of young people involved in incidents, however many, and then a percentage are involved in multiple, and and so it it can be. I absolutely take your point. The what might be, you know, wrongly construed from that data and so we will seek to address that. That's great. I just thought an additional line in there to to, to give a percentage of the instances re relating to well to young people, the amount of instances that are multiple. So thank you very much. Yeah, good good point, Bailey Hearn. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Massey. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm on Appendix 2 and page 68, 69 of our pack, uh, positive school leavers destinations. Uh, I see it's very pleasing to see that Perth and Can Ross area figure of 95.97% for school leavers going on to a positive destination is not only above Payside figure, but also above the national figure. Uh, I'm interested in the nature of the positive destinations that these young people are entering into. Do you have any information on this that can be shared with the committee? Uh, Mr McCluskey? Thanks, Karina. Yes, yeah, so that, that measures the, the annual participation measure for all 16 to 19 year olds. So it's it's a bit subtly different from pure school leavers. So it does count the young people who are actually still at our schools as well. So, but it, it gives a more holistic measure that's preferred uh, generally across Scotland by Skills Development in Scotland um, so that we avoid snapshots, perhaps of young people leaving school and then having a failed destination that they go to. So it's that kind of longer term picture. In terms of that measure, though, you know, we're normally sitting around about 70, 71 percent of young people who are in education of some sort. That may be school, it may be further education, it may be higher education, and round about 20 percent who are in employment. Um, and then the remainder of that, that positive figure is made up of uh, bespoke arrangements through our employability teams of things like um, skills academies. Um, or uh, activity agreements, for example, for young people who are not quite ready to make the transition to formal education. They've left school, not ready to make the transition to formal education or uh, onto uh, kind of further learning, if you like. So it's part of a pathway for that. So, so I hope that that answers your question. It does. Thank you, um, Councillor Barrett. Please. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, I, ha I have a few questions, but I'll start with a, a general one about the paper. Um, I found it difficult. I was comparing this year's report um, and plan with last year's plan to, to see how we were progressing, and it was difficult to re relate the key achievements and performance section 
in this report to the how will we know section in last year's report. Um, there were frequent references to materials being having been provided in this year's report, whereas last year's report quite often talked about implementation, but we didn't have clear stats on that. So I just wanted to ask if that could please be addressed going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barrett. I, I might ask you to comment a little bit again, David, but I think I think the fact that we now have definitive proper stretch aims might, might help in that regard. I don't know. Uh, Mr McCluskey, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know what you're saying, Councillor Barrett. I suppose um, that from our point of view, we've tried to be really explicit um, and, and perhaps we've not totally hit the mark there. And the, I think it's Appendix 2 of the report where we've identified all of the outcomes that we were, we were trying to kind of reach and then talked about the activity that's happened over that year um, and where we are with it at the moment. Um, and yeah, indeed, stretch aims are our, our ultimate measure of, of success. I suppose some of them take a wee bit longer than a school year to kind of come through in terms of impact. Um, but but it's something we'll go back and have a look at again. Uh, yeah, fair point, there, Councillor Barr. Thank you, David. Councillor James, please. Thanks, convener, uh, and probably. Uh, apologies in advance because I, I am substituting on this committee, so it was um, quite late getting the uh, agenda and everything uh, and looking through. I, I was quite worried. Uh, appendix 3, page 78, um, the last table, uh, incidents of distress challenging, violent and aggressive behaviour, it sort of follows on from um, Councillor Orbelia Hearns question. Uh, I was really worried and concerned there to see the number of primary DCVAs. Uh, and uh, I suppose you know, we're afraid of saying anything these days or doing anything these days for fear of upsetting anybody or, or, or challenging times, convener. Uh, my question really is, what disciplinary measures are available to the teachers and what measures are in place to protect the teachers, which, you know, it's difficult enough employing them as it is. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor James. Uh, no apologies required. I think we're all well, well aware sometimes of the limitations of substituting on, on committees, um, and it's a valid question. I, I would say that I don't think anybody's scared of saying and doing anything in these matters. I, th I think I will respectfully disagree with that synopsis, but um, I don't know if uh, Mr McCluskey or Mrs uh, Sheena, thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Um, the data that, that we uh, are sharing here today is data that we have um, discussed in various committees um, over the piece and is probably reflective of data that will be discussed at similar committees in other parts of Scotland and indeed the UK. In terms of the fact that we've moved from just recording what has been called in the past violent and aggressive behaviour includes also um, incidences where children are distressed or, or find it very challenging to, to, to moderate their, their behaviour. So often young people may act out, but not out of any malice or any intent. And so what we're trying to do is, is understand the, the scale and the extent of that. However, there are a number of um, frameworks and policies that are in place that are designed to support staff in terms of helping them manage incidences of distress, challenging, violent and aggressive behaviour. And within those policies, there are sanctions that schools and teachers can and do adopt. So it's not as if there are, there are no sanctions that are able to be used, but they would be context specific and, you know, many and varied and it's, it's something that we have certainly shared information with with a range of other members and if it was helpful for you to find out a bit more about the detail of that then we'd be very happy to do that but I think I would really want to leave you with a reassurance that there are frameworks guidance and policies that are there as I say to guide staff and to support staff in school because we want our staff to be able to come to school and be able to do the job that, that we want them to do, which is effectively teach the children and young people who are in our classes. And so we are cognizant of the fact that 
a range of different supports are required. We have an ongoing working group that's made up of staff in schools, our trade union representative colleagues and central staff who are continually looking at different ways of more effective reporting and responding to the, the reporting of such incidences in as close to real time as possible, because that also helps provide reassurance for staff that people are listening and take a cognizance of any situations that emerge. But I would bring us back to the, the question that Bailey Ahern raised right at the beginning, which is to say that, you know, in terms of these incidents, it is less than 1% of the pupil population of our schools and that the vast majority of our children, and this has been played out in what's called the Bisser Report, which is the Behaviour in Scotland Schools Report, the vast majority of children in schools across Scotland and in Perth and Ross come to school well prepared to, to learn and do behave appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. I do, I do think the ongoing work of the the working group will be will be really important. Uh, Councillor Stewart, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go right back to the beginning. We had a wee bit of enhanced transition in primary one this year. I was wondering what the challenges have been and what kind of solutions you've come across. Because um, I know that there's some primary one mentions in the plan in the appendix. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Um, Mrs Dugan. So the, um, this session, um, building on work that we had um, put in place last session for pupils in primary one, we've deployed additional teaching and support staff to um, identify classes across Perth and Kinross where there's a requirement for an enhanced level of support for some of our children who are coming into primary one with an increasing level of um, additional support needs. Um, this consists of additional teaching and non-teaching staff. Um, we've also um, begun a programme of, or um, developed, further developed, I would say, a programme of professional learning for all of the staff who um, work with the ch children in primary one. It's um, very early into the term, but early indications are that we've had a positive start to the use of this model this year. We'll continue to monitor that and we'll continue with the professional learning for staff. Uh, thank you, Mrs Dugan. I, I certainly do recall um, the last Finance and Resources Committee being asked for quite a lot of money, I think, actually, and it was really nice that it was supported by all the members of that committee right across the political spectrum, so that, that's appreciated as well. But uh, thank you, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Cuthbert, please. Thank you, convener. Um, the report mentions that uh, to, to prepare this report, there's been collaboration with stakeholders. Um, I'm a co-opted member of the Kinross High School Parent Council. And during this last year that I've sat on that committee, there has been no consultation on improvement planning. So I'm really looking for reassurance that that's just an, an odd occasion and that, that in future all community councils, will, uh, sorry, parent councils will be consulted. I mean, I, I will ask the question of officers. I, I know, I know. Going back to my um, days of being on parent councils and indeed chairing the parent council when I was a parent, um, we were always consulted. We had a really good head teacher at the time, of course, who's sitting in the back row. But we were always consulted on that, and I know that the four schools I represent them award because Councillor Massey and I always attend these parent councils. We were always asked genuinely without exception about the school improvement plan. So it, it does feel without being too personal about this situation that, that it does feel like it's a it's not the norm. But I, I don't know if any officer wants to wants to comment or whether we're happy to leave it that. Sheena, please. In terms of the, the education improvement plan, the, there is a, a, a range of ways with which we do consult with a wide range of stakeholders, which does include uh, parent council reps. As I said earlier, we meet twice a year with parent council reps and through that consultation we share areas of development and, and seek feedback on that. In terms of your specific example around the parent council that you're a co-opted member of, I understand there's been quite a bit of work underway between the chair of the parent council and the head teacher to look at ways to ensure that the parent council are involved in that process, Councillor Cuthbert. So I'm confident that if that has not happened, that that will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Shires, please. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, my question is kind of a two-parter. Um, in your introduction, the um, strategically um, reference the, um, I can't remember what the word you used was, but it was about more presentation of young people um, for exams, which resulted in an increase in, in grade A to Cs. Um, was was that a deliberate policy to um, uh, present young people who might otherwise not have, have done that? And if it is, that's very positive and encouraging. Um, my, my second part of the question was, is the data captured anywhere of young people who don't achieve expected grades and then maybe go on to reset the course? Um, how is that then uh, presented? Because that would, uh, if they then went on to, to achieve uh, grades in their second attempt at it, that would obviously be a, a positive one and one a good message for young people that, you know, when we all do the, you know, no wrong door and all of that stuff, that actually it's not it's not a failure to then go in and, and sit it. So I wanted to know about the first part and then how the second part links up with that. I think that's a really good question. Councillor says, I don't know the answer, but I'm hoping that Mr McCluskey might. Sorry, David. Apologies, the, the mic wasn't on. I'd Apologies, I've wiped out. So, yes, go sorry. for it again. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Shires. Yeah, in terms of your first question, the short answer is yes. It's part of a raising attainment strategy and part of the kind of um, quality improvement framework that we've built with our secondary schools to be ambitious in terms of presentation. And of course, th there's always more to do. In, in terms of that second part of your question, um, which was about, you know, what about the young people that perhaps don't make their expected grades? Um, well, you know, the first thing is, obviously, we're in a happy place where there's fewer of them than there are in some other localities. So that's, that's good that we know who where they are. It's also a question about us always having another plan for young people. So a good example would be young people who don't get a grade A to D at National 5. Um, it's about ensuring that they then have a National 4 option um, ready to present on, if you know, so that they're, get, they're getting some kind of certification for that subject in that year. Schools work really hard all year in terms of the tracking and monitoring and the estimating process, and we work alongside them with that so that we know what young people are potentially in danger of non-achievement and that can shape their, their curriculum moving ahead. And then I think that the other thing that I would say is that, you know, Scottish Government provide a, a, a data engine called Insight that allows us to drill into kind of granular detail um, of every young person in the presentation so that we can then track young people in terms of particularly those who have maybe not had the greatest start in S4 for whatever reason to ensure that we keep them at school for longer so that they get the full opportunity to the end of S6 um, to gain the, 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 the attainment that they really want. And it, I suppose the last part of that question would be we recognise that it, um, improving our staying on rate from S4 into S5 and S5 into S6 is a key part of that strategy. So last year that improved for 2% for us um, and that's an ongoing improvement action for all of our schools. Thank you, Ms McCluskey. Uh, thank you, Councillor Shires. Um, I think, uh, Councillor Barrett next, please, if that's OK for a second. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I welcome on page 43 the increase in the Digital School and Rights Respecting School awards, but I'm noting the drop from 34 to 27 in the number of schools and early learning centres that are accredited as eco schools. There is reference in the plan to increasing the focus on learning for sustainability, and I just wondered if we could have more information on that um, to meet PKC's corporate priority of tackling climate change and supporting sustainable places. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Mrs Dugan again, please. Thank you. Um, so yes, the, the numbers, um, actually the numbers in the, the report um, reflect a, a positive approach to ensuring um, that climate change awareness is, is front and to, to the front of all that's done. Um, not all schools choose to focus at particular times on the award, but all are really encouraged in terms of their approach to um, paying attention to, to climate change and the uh, eco schools. We have been working with all schools and making sure that they're very aware around 
Um, last year's priority of the energy consumption um, climate ready classroom um, and we're just about to share the targets in terms of the climate change strategy action plan for schools and make sure that that to, to the front um, and with a bit of encouragement around the, the pupil groups um, and the work that they take forward with that. So there'll be an ongoing focus with that, just regardless of whether somebody is going, a school is going towards their um, award this year. Thank you, Mrs. Dougal. Have I seen a light to comment and I'll bring you back in, Councillor Barrett, if that's okay. Beg your pardon. I'll start again. Sorry. Uh, I think one of the things that's that's really quite interesting in this particular area is that for a long time, eco schools was the only award, if you like, that of gave some kind of recognition of particular work that schools were doing in this important area. And now what we have are, are a range of different approaches, some of which are certificated, some of which have awards associated with them, and others that don't. But the whole drive of learning for sustainability, which is a key plank of the National Improvement Framework, is something that is absolutely implicit in the curriculum in every school. So there might not be an accreditation in terms of an award per se that folks have worked through, but it doesn't mean to say that the learning hasn't taken place. And so we do have things like the Keeping Scotland's Beautiful Eco Schools. We do have climate ready classrooms. We do have learning for sustainability um, recognition of curriculum design, for example, but there wouldn't necessarily be a certificate or an award that goes along with that. So I hope that's a bit of reassurance to you that this is not something that's becoming less important or dropping off folks' agenda. Actually, the reverse is true. There's a, a wider range of ways for schools to participate in this, this important area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is reassuring. Um, and just could I ask as a follow up on page 58, good progress has been made with a 7% reduction in energy consumption in the primary schools. The target was 10%. Do we know when we're likely to reach that? Mrs Dugan. Yeah, we don't know when we're likely to reach that, but we are very focused on ensuring that awareness is kept to the fore around that. And um, we were very pleased at the, the engagement in the, the, the um, drive last year, and I'm confident that drive will continue. Yeah, apologies. It is an important question, Councillor Barrett. It's, yeah, it's important with the way which we strive towards that. But uh, I was hesitant in asking uh, Mrs Dugan with apology. I suspected that it was a difficult but important question to answer. So thank you. And apologies, Councillor Duff, I was remiss in not noticing your cue in the chat there, but be delighted to hear your question now, please, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, no apology necessary. Um, on page 40, uh, there is a, a small table there with four graphs about increases in uh, ESN additional support needs over time um, and sadly uh, each of these four uh, categories are showing increases over the period 2016 to 2023 um, including what probably are fairly big increases in the autism and communication support uh, <coughs> graphs uh, in particular. Um, it goes on to talk about social emotional behaviour needs being the most frequent reason for support. Um, come back to, to this year's budget, we put some money in to help implement quiet spaces within schools for young people with higher levels of dysregulation. And I wondered if we had managed to implement uh, any of these quiet spaces and whether they were having the desired effect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Duff. You, you're being modest on behalf of your colleagues sitting next to it was a it was a, a, a good proposal, I think, that Councillor Shires had, and I will ask, I think, Fiona Mackay if we've made any progress on it. Um, yes, we haven't um, spent all of that money yet because the, there is uh, further work that needs to be done. But one of the things that we have progressed already is to use it to support some of those primary ones that we spoke about earlier. Um, and that's uh, been most effectively done through the, the purchase of 
areas that will be able to give us quiet spaces. So teepees and um, I can't remember the, the terms for some of the other ones, but some some uh, ways for separating rooms as well, so that we're creating spaces within existing classrooms that children can take themselves to um, when they feel there's a need for that. So some of that work has progressed and we're looking to build on that over the rest of the year. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Um, Bill Ahern, please. Thank you very much, Convener. My question uh, is on page 77, the top table. Uh, attainment, percentage of children and young people achieving expected curriculum for excellence levels. And to me, this is a very important uh, table because it actually shows what we're achieving in our schools and moving forward. However, to me, there's some data missing there. So the first um, graph shows the whole cohort and it includes P1, 4 and 7 for literacy and numeracy, but it's no longer broken down in the, uh, the next three tables. Um, and I wondered why that was. And I suppose also there's a question as to why we clump P1, 4 and 7 together. To me, P7 is a very important year, so we know how the primary education is going well. The people that are the young people that are achieving um, the, re the required level of excellence before they move up to secondary school. Um, and the, the ch challenges and there's also uh, when we talk about ASN, we're talking about various groups of people with ASN. So there's learning disabilities as well as various or a myriad of mental health conditions, some of which, as we know, autism do produce very bright uh, young people um, and in other aspects they're very challenging so I think they should be separated from P, P1 and 4 and P7 should be probably separated so we know whether the whole of primary education is being successful in achieving those levels but and also want to know why we can't see there what the breakdown is uh, in terms of the ASN, non-ASN and those in care. Thank you. Thanks Bailey Hen. Um, David please. Uh, Billy, and I suppose in terms of the, 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 the banding together of P1, 4 and 7 literacy and numeracy in this report, that reflects the way that we report to Scottish Government in terms of the, their core stretch aim, if you like. So, you know, it's a bit about just keeping that statistically coherent um, because we have a, a stretch aim set round about that. Um, S3 literacy and numeracy are a little bit different because Scottish Government aren't so interested in that, but we are. That's one of our core plus stretches, so that's why it sits a little bit outside of it. Um, I think the other thing probably to be mindful of is there'll be a raise an attainment report uh, coming to this committee in October, and at that we'll be able to kind of dive in a little bit deeper into individual cohorts because you're absolutely right about different rates of progress and different challenges and different opportunities within each cohort and some of those key transitions uh, moving ahead. Um, and I think that the last point was about ASN and again, you know, the, the detail that's provided here is an amalgamation of ASN, but I suppose the reassurance is that you're absolutely right, that the ASN is a diverse picture and that we do hold the data um, that looks at attainment in terms of different levels of ASN as well. And that's part of, you know, the improvement planning that goes into that, that field of things moving ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCluskey. A point well made, though, Bailey Hearn. Uh, Councillor Cuthbert, please. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I'd, I'd like to go back to this, the uh, paragraph that uh, Bailey Hearn raised at the start of this questioning session. Um, in principle, it's talking about the um, bad behaviour in schools and the, the ASN impact. Um, I was sent a chart and showing the, the different types of ASN and how that was broken down, how it shifted over time. And what I found interesting is that social, emotional and behavioural difficulty represent almost a third of ASN pupils. Um, and it's, it's had quite a big jump. It's a 5% increase from 2022 to 23, which is the latest data I've got. So I'm just wondering what specific um, interventions, if you like, are we taking to help those people to, to stop them having social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Thank you, Billy Hearn. I'm, I'm pleased that you you asked for that. Um, sorry, Councillor Cuthbert. I'm pleased that you asked for that. I got that. I'm not quite sure what I learned from it, but it was really interesting. Um, um, Fiona Mackay, please. Um, 
So social, emotional and behavioural needs is a is a very broad um, definition and, and actually can encompass quite a number of um, diagnosis or, or uh, undiagnosed, but I say uh, work uh, additional support needs that we need to provide further um, assessment on. And that's always our starting point is to look to understand what what might be happening behind. And also that does then form the biggest group that we have. Sometimes that may change over time as we begin to understand and, and uh, be able to determine what will work best with a young person. Um, so the, the range of interventions that we might use are really very diverse because that, that encompasses all from um, those young people who may have anxiety or higher levels of um, dysregulation, uh, but it might also in, incorporate a number of other young people who just have not yet had their diagnosis. Um, so I think it's very difficult to be specific about what implementation, how we would intervene and implement, other than to say that what we would do, always do, would be to start with assessment and look to build up an understanding and a picture that is specific to the individual needs of the young person. Susie, I don't know if there's anything further you would want to add. I think maybe just helpful to emphasise that there's also a lot of work that happens at the universal level. So we have a number of social and emotional learning programmes in our schools and have recently worked over the course of this year to provide um, that in one place as a toolkit um, for primary staff that will be launching with schools over this coming year. Um, Sheila, do you want to add, please, as well? And just to give a couple of very specific examples, Councillor Cuthbert, we have undertaken um, and invested in what's called self-regulation training for staff across a range of schools. The workforce development that's been mentioned already in relation to the um, people support assistants, who are quite an extensive workforce across our schools, have had very specific training in a number of areas there to help support young people managing and regulating their behaviour. There's a range of other interventions that are undertaken by um, the educational psychology team that, that work in quite a, a targeted way with specific um, children and young people in specific cohorts. We've also had um, considerable investment through Perth Autism Support, who provide targeted support for families through connecting families. And we've also got, um, using some of our um, Scottish Equity Fund money, a project officer around wider achievement and equity <coughs> that works with schools to ensure that appropriate support and provision is in place for particular youngsters in secondary school. So th there's actually a range of, of different programmes, training and investment that, that's underway. But as, as Fiona says, this, this you know, is always under review and evolution as well. And so part of what we'll do is in the papers that we'll bring to committee in November time, we will go into a bit more detail about some of those investments and some of those specific interventions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've got a question, second question from Councillor Stewart. I think Councillor Barrett may still have a question. And um, in the nicest possible way, we'll kind of make this uh, last call for any more questions, if that's OK. But Councillor Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, <laughs> I think my question might have been answered. Um, it was touching um, about uh, young learners with additional support needs. And as um, Bailey O'Hearn mentioned about the challenges and the there's a greater awareness of um, people's needs and there's and I'm just wondering what if there's been have the team learned is there opportunities about looking at the uh, supporting people to the with the, the the wider learning environment yeah thank you councillor Stewart hey, Fiona McKay Um, in terms of looking at learning, I think that that's something that's definitely always at the forefront of, of what we're doing. Um, where we're looking at the primary one cohort and that, that um, range of needs where we've seen increased needs coming in at primary one, um, it's very much uh, 
a development area uh, where we have built on what we've we learned from last year in terms of the the supports and the, the type of um, opportunities, particularly for learning through play, that um, have been able to be incorporated this year based on our experiences. But it doesn't stop at, at primary one either. I mean, I think that there is, there's a, a range of other opportunities that we're taking, which will uh, be fully fleshed out, I suppose, as part of the additional support needs transformation programme, um, where we're looking to uh, incorporate uh, all of the, the work and observations that we've been able to make over um, a range of time, as well as understanding uh, what research and good practice is out there in other local authorities, as well as across our schools, um, to, to be able to take forward um, some quite significant uh, developments that will help to, to support children and young people. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Uh, Councillor Barrett, please. Thank you, convener. Um, just following on from that, I think this is for Fiona too, perhaps on page 73, um, we talk about the ELC settings having well-being champions. And I just wondered how I know there are a lot of children coming through into primary one who need a lot of support, but are we finding that the work being done in ELCs is being effective in perhaps reducing the number of children coming through to school with special needs, which obviously will reduce class disruption and improve learning for them? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. I, I, I was still um, hopeful that the expansion of earlier childcare will make a big difference in a lot of these respects, but um, I don't really know what I'm speaking about. Ben usually does those, so well, maybe I'll skip to respond, please. Yes, thank you. Um, we launched the Wellbeing Champions probably in the previous year, so we're still making our way through ensuring that they, that's embedded in all settings. Um, so these Wellbeing Champions are trained in specific techniques around about um, encouraging children to be able to use vocabulary to, to, to describe their feelings um, that over time should benefit them in terms of being able to talk about things rather than acting that out. So it's probably very early days to say, but over time we would anticipate that that would impact on children coming through into primary schools. Thank you, Ben. Um, Councillor Duff, you have the last question, please. Uh, thank you. It reminds us on uh, page um, 47 of the pack. It's in relation to the attendance graphs there. <clears throat> we can see that the primary attendance is generally high, but and going in the right direction uh, to meet the stretch aim of 94, leading on to 95%. However, in the secondary attendance, um, it's a worsening picture by and large, and we're getting further away from the um, stretch aim of 89% leading to 92%. And I wondered um, what measures are we trying to put in place to try and improve attendance of secondary pupils? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. It is, it is a very topical question, certainly. I know that um, attendance, that there's a little bit of suffering in terms of attendance levels right across the country, which can be damaging in many ways. I know that David McCluskey has um, done a lot of work already on this, so I'll ask David to comment, please. Yes, I mean, there is that national picture uh, can be that you've explained, but you know it's obviously a key concern of ours. Um, we are quite rightly very proud of the progress we've made against many of our stretch aims and attendance stands out in many ways. I suppose the first thing to say is that it's not progress, but our attendance stayed static last session compared to the, se the session before and we arrested what had been a decline in terms of that instance. In terms of some of the activity that sits round about that in our secondary schools, um, Sheen and I met with the secondary head teachers only this morning and it was top of our agenda. Um, and Members of the committee will know that we had three attendance forums last year and from that a range of improvement actions came out. So some of those were about really knowing our data round about attendance so that we knew what groups were more susceptible to poor attendance. Another was about schools looking to their own context to make their own what we call public promises round about that attendance picture um, to try to arrest that decline and try to move things forward. I think there was other things that we did in terms of our centralised support of schools around about the data picture of attendance. We've now got far more responsive data about attendance than we had previously. Um, we obviously have a revised attendance framework and a staged intervention framework um, that we've shared with all schools. We're really 
keyly linked into Education Scotland uh, about some of the natural, uh, sorry, the national work that's going on around about attendance as well. And we're kind of really worked uh, hand in hand with them moving ahead. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it would be fair to say that, you know, that they attend some of the individual school strategies that have, that have been employed in secondary schools have been really successful. So we've looked to see whether there was success in a context and see how that could be used in another context across the piece. And I suppose, you know, the, the final thing I would say really in terms of secondary attendance is that we know from research that the first two weeks of school attendance are absolutely crucial in setting positive habits for the year ahead. So, you know, we're monitoring that on a daily basis. So I, I'm really pleased that, you know, as of tomorrow will be, or sorry, today will be the second full week of secondary education. Um, and as of today, our secondary attendance is sitting above 90%. So we need to take that and build upon that as we move ahead. Uh, and all schools have the tools uh, and the, the capacity to make that a, a, key, a key part of what they're doing uh, as part of that attendance. Uh, issue that we have. So there's certainly no shortage of strategic and operational heft being put into this as we move ahead. Thank you very much, David. I, I do think it's important to note that there are often really good reasons why young learners can't go to school because of illness or because they have a, a support need, which is particularly challenging at that time. But it's also really important that we get as many of our kids into school as we, as we possibly can where it's appropriate. So thank you very much for that answer. Um, I'm going to move to the report at this stage. There's 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 a lot in this report. I'm not going to try and regurgitate it. Um, I, do, I do think the fact that we have stressed in this report that there will be a focus on attainment and not least the poverty related attainment gap and, if, and on additional support need, which is, is quite right, and the behaviour in schools generally. Um, I think that's all really important. I think the stretch aims are ambitious, but but important that we we get there. And the, the last thing I would say, and I, and I think what I don't know whether this was what you were trying to allude to or not, Councillor Stewart, but I do think in terms of additional support need, because quite rightly there's a focus from across this committee on additional support need, uh, and that, that's entirely appropriate and important. But I do think that. There are, although, the, although there are challenges, I do think there are opportunities here. If we are, if the awareness of um, the, the complex needs of our learners are recognised early on, I think it does give us an opportunity to for better outcomes for those particular young learners. And I think that's really important. I don't know if that's what you were alluding to or not. I suspect it was, and if it was, thank you, because it's a it's a fair point. So I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Carr to second this report, please. Happy to second the report. Uh, thank you. Any comments on the report? Um, if not, can we agree the report? Uh, sorry, Councillor Sanders, you, you, you chair. Uh, I was only going to say it's a, it's a really interesting read as much as anything. I thought the I, I took on board the comments that um, Councillor Barrett made about some of the formatting and referencing back to to other documents, but it is a really interesting reading. And, and behind all of that are young people, children, parents, staff. You know, um, and I think it's sort of. I, I thought the the format where it talked about the economic um, picture around power thinking was the status of um, poverty in in different communities. I thought all of that painted the picture, which you could then view the statistics and the data um, on top of that. So I, I find that all really interesting and, and it's a, a good to see that onward progress that we all seek to to keep going. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, point Councillor Shares. And, and, and in moving the report, I did start to write something and I, I, because there is so much in it and a lot of it is around Around poverty and challenge and whatnot, and I realised that I, I just that it was impossible to to sum up all all our thoughts in in introducing this report. So I, I just decided not to do it. But if, can we formally agree the report, please? Thank you very much. Um, do we need a comfort break at this point, or are we content to, to carry on? Carry on. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, paper seven is the Perth and Cross Community Learning and Development Plan. I'm delighted to say that we've got David here to introduce it and uh, welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener. 
Uh, this report sets out the key actions and achievements from year two of the statutory community land development plan. The report identifies areas for future improvement, the outcomes from the successful Education Scotland progress visit, the plans for producing a new CLD plan to cover 24-27, and a summary of the recently completed independent review of CLD, which was conducted by the Scottish Government. Uh, myself and colleagues from the CLD leadership group are present to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, David. Any questions, please? Um, thank, thank you, convener. Uh, my question is really a, a general question on the report. Uh, the report outlines the work that's carried out by the inclusion service in working with children with additional support needs. And I just wonder what particular challenges are presented by these children and how does the community learning and development approach help address these? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, Fiona, sorry. Apologies. Hi. Um, in terms of the, the challenges that, that present, I think a lot of that is around feeling that they have um, good engagement and participation in terms of informing decision making and um, direction of, of services often. Um, and that, that's probably the um, common for many of our vulnerable groups that are supported through the CLD plan. Um, so in terms of how we support um, young people that are feeling that they, they need a voice, particularly around their additional support needs and feeling that they have community in relation to, to their own needs, um, that's why we developed the Inclusion Ambassadors in conjunction with uh, Children in Scotland. And that's an area that we want to continue to grow this year. At the moment, there in, there's two groups in different areas, one group in Perth City and one group in the Creef and Strathairn um, community area. Um, and we would want over the, the current year to continue to develop that to have a wider range. But in general, I'd say that the, our approaches are around those people who feel more marginalised um, and who may feel that they they have more challenges with feeling included. Um, and it's about then taking a, a, a an opportunity to come alongside, but also help people feel connected with other people um, who can support them. Thank you, Fiona. Councillor Massey, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'm looking at Appendix 3 on page 129, uh, the Community Learning and Development Progress Report, uh, dated 11th of June 2024 by Education Scotland. Uh, on page 131 of our pack under the heading, how well does the performance of the local authority and their CLD partners demonstrate positive impact? Uh, it was a very rep pleasing report to read, but what particularly caught my eye when reading the report was where it talked about the intergenerational peers early education partnership learning together programme and the benefits it has for participants. The report then goes on to say on page 132 that this is a practice worth sharing. So my question is, can you share with the committee and those watching online more about what the programme involves? Thank you. Ben, thank you. Yes, um, so first of all, it's probably sensible to say that the PEEP Learning Together programme is something that the parenting and family learning team and the early years practitioners undertake and have done for a very long time with families of young children and parents. So it's something that helps um, children bond more with their, their parent, but also um, extend their language and communication um, through stories, singing, um, arts and crafts and generally having fun together. So that's that just gives a little bit of a, a historical view to it. Um, however, the intergenerational PEEP was piloted at Strathmore Street sheltered housing over at Bridgend last year. So we took the PEEP family learning programme um, together to the tenants of that sheltered housing and they um, opted to come and join us. And so we recognised that as an opportunity to allow the tenants there to 
come out of their flats, if you like. Um, and we hoped that this would reduce isolation, loneliness and associated poor mental health. And so this was a collaboration between um, the parenting and family learning team and um, colleagues from housing and communities. And they facilitated that programme together. And the sessions included all the things that I had mentioned that any of the PEEP Learning Together sessions would incorporate. Um, but they also, um, we provided food and there was opportunities to, to socialise and eat together. Um, we had lots of um, quantitative feedback in terms of data around about what our um, parents children and the tenants thought about it but just to exemplify I thought I'd give you some actual um, statements from the parents. So one parent had said it um, helped me to get out and meet new people and that's what I needed. Um, another parent said the group has made my daughter, fe daughter feel more relaxed around about older people. A tenant said it makes me get out of my flat and join in and communicate with others. It's good to socialise. And another tenant said it helps the days to be less lonely. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Councillor Massey, and gives uh, people online and committee a bit more information. That was a really lovely answer, actually, Ben. Thank you very much. I, I know that I, I think that intergenerational work is going to be really important. I had the first experience of that when Councillor Sayer took the committee down to Orderada in 2017, I think it was, and um, it was really, it was really nice. So, uh, uh, and sorry, Ben, you're. Could I just add? You could. Um, as a result of that, sorry, we've actually taken it. It was a pilot, but we've taken it to Charterhouse Court as well and we've returned back to Strathmore Street again. So that's three undertakings so far. Uh, well, that's good news. Thank you, Ben. I think it is really important and I know uh, Councillor Massey is sometimes humble as well, but I know that it's really important to you, Ian, as the older people's champion and I think it is really important. About it. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, I've written CS, yeah, so that's Councillor Shire. Sorry, I'm mental, but they're just well, Thank you, uh, convener. Um, my question is struggling a bit with the technology there, but it's on page one three one, which is the um, the progress visit report, um, and it refers to, and it's one of our real success stories. That I don't think we shout from the rooftops enough, and that's the Universal Youth Work Partnership, because if any of us ever talked to colleagues in other local authorities, they would bite their arm off to have similar to to ours. And it's something that I just definitely think we should sing about more um, but it was just to ask about progress on that and I mean it's been going since what 2019 now um, and to get a bit of an update I probably should declare as a trustee of SCID that I do have a wee bit of an interest in this but we've all got interest in it from our uh, areas and um, so just an update on how that's going in and a commitment is that something we're committed to for the future. Linda please. Thanks, Councillor Shires. Well, yes, and I would love to sing from the rooftops about just how wonderful this partnership is. And I have to say it's a commitment from um, the Council and from the Ganaki Trust to continue the partnership. So at the beginning of this year, the um, retendering process be, uh, was undertaken and a further three years um, with an option of four and five has been awarded to all of the five partners who have been part of it from the very beginning. So yes, it will be continuing. I have to say that uh, our experience has been that the young people have been the true beneficiaries of this service. It ha happens in their local community, they've created a voice, they've been seen um, and I think what they, they have found is that they've been welcomed over the door um, and you know that is only to the greater good. But I think the unintended consequences of the partnership and this is really to attribute to the staff both at Scott Street but also the staff and all of the universal partners the coming together and sharing of resources, um, mini buses and training and doing different things together with um, the, the kind of expertise that, uh, you know, some of the more long established youth, youth universal partners have had versus the new ones. 
all of that has been an unintended benefit for them all. So Brian brings them together on a regular basis to share that kind of practice, experience and training. And I think that is something that we never thought would happen at the very beginning. So uh, I would commend them all for being open to, to doing that. Um, the young people themselves, the feedback is that they are benefiting hugely from um, the, the partnership and from having those services within their, their local community. And it is those services that are then supporting the discussion that we had earlier about the youth forum and creating a voice across Perth and Kinross that is representative of Perth and Kinross. So it's not just young people who are in Perth City, which has probably traditionally been the case, but actually some of the young people from our rural communities where the challenges for them being young people in rural communities are very different. So um, bringing all of that together and creating a voice and feeling part of something for all of those young people and creating the youth forum and hopefully continuing to support that is all partly due to the Universal Youth Work Partnership. So yes, I would shout from the rooftops too. Well said Linda, thanks for the question Councillor Shares. Councillor Cuthbert. Thank you Convener. I was going to take us back to ASN again just for the fun of it. Um, English as an additional language, um, I note that there's 1,249 children um that, that's for an asn reason why they their additional support needs that seems to be rising roughly 100 kids a year so i was just wondering how cld are working with the schools and with these children to to help them learn the language and, and improve their english uh, fiona mckay please um, so our um early uh, English as an additional language team um, that we have within the inclusion service has uh, is a multidisciplinary team. So it has some teaching resource within that, but it also has community link workers um, and community learning assistants within that. And they have a, a really key role in terms of engaging both with the parents and with any services that they're then needing to to support or to access to support. So our approach um, in terms of that is very much about um, addressing the needs that that families themselves bring to us. Uh, and often it's around um, our children and our young people often have better English than some of their parents. And therefore the it's parental support that's needed on an ongoing basis um, to to um, help them support to integrate within our communities. If you like, Councillor Cuthbert. Yeah, what, what I'm thinking is that I would like to see that number coming down so that the children don't need additional support because they've got English that's good enough, if you see what I mean. And I'm wondering, do the children get taught out of school, after school? Is, is CLD involved or, or how does it work? You want to? In terms of acquisition of the language, that's generally done within their teaching um, support. Also, obviously, the the community link workers and community learning assistants are bilingual as well. So there are opportunities to to reinforce that when they're meeting out with school. Um, I think there are, are specific definitions around what around additional support. Um, needs and the, the the fact that if somebody has English as an additional language allows them to be registered um, as having an ESN uh, even as their language is developing. Uh, David, do you want to add to that, please? Yeah, yeah it's just um, picking up the, the, the element about the community provision. So some of the adult learning partnerships, some of those providers are working with similar groups to Fiona's team, uh, working with parents and children, young people to improve language skills. So there is elements of that carrying on as well. And obviously, there's still things like ESOL Perth do quite a lot of that work as well. Thank you, David. Thank you, Councillor Cuthbert. Councillor Stewart, please. Thank you. Um, in the report, uh, we were informed about planning the the next iteration of the CLD and in section 8.1 it, it states about ex, um, having extensive engagement with partners 
I was wondering, um, are you in a position to tell us, are you going to consult with people? Thanks for the question. We, we've just finished the, the consultation on that, and that was predominantly around our CLD partnership. So I took in some of the locality groups, which is the stronger communities networks, which I think some elected members attend as well as community reps and frontline services. Uh, we spoke to our adult learning partnership, the youth work partnership, uh, other commission services, uh, learners, staff as well. We're given the opportunity to uh, do that. And that was an online survey uh, structured around the priorities for the local outcomes improvement plan because the CLD plan needs to align um, with that. And we just finished the analysis of that and the priorities which are coming through as you would expect around tackling poverty, supporting children and young people and um, working with communities. So it's going to align quite nicely actually with the, the corporate plan. So that's how we'll be um, presenting the plan and we'll be bringing that to you in October. Thank you, David. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Duff, please. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, as, as you know, occasionally it is my want to ask questions about the Gaelic language, and uh, I'm quite asking Up regarding <laughs> page 99 uh, and 100 in the report, and I'm pleased to see the measures they are um, encouraging uh, children and their families to use Gaelic uh, in their homes and in their communities. I'm interested particularly in the uh, item on page 100, which talks about parents of children in Gaelic medium education being offered the opportunity to learn Gaelic with other parents. And I wondered if that is a, an opportunity that would be open to other uh, adults, not necessarily parents of children in Gallant Medium Education, uh, to take part in, or if indeed it is already open to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. David, please. Yeah, David McCluskey, please. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously we've got a Gallic language plan, um, and this sits within there, and actually there's some mention of it in an education improvement plan as well. Um, and I think the answer is that these opportunities have been afforded to a range of different people, so for example, staff working within PKC. So that's certainly a suggestion that I'll take back to our, um, well, one of my QIO team, Donald McLeod, who, who's got the kind of operational uh, brief on Gaelic um, to see if there's capacity to expand that moving ahead. Thank you, David. Councillor Duff. Apple it. <laughs> Your Gaelic's always been far better than mine, so thank you though. Um, the last question is Councillor Shires. I was going to try and say something back to you in Gaelic there, but I better not. Councillor Shires. Thank you, Convener. Um, at 6.3 in the report, it talks about PKC staff and CLD staff having access to a wide range of high quality training development opportunities. And I think I think all of us will identify the, the people that we come into contact with. You know, they're, they're really at the, the sort of front front end, whatever the expression is, you know, front line of uh, service provision with our communities and often the, the people that are there when things are not going as well as they should be and um, you know they're there to help build capacity which can be challenging if 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 the community is not behind a particular project or, or whatever um, and I have the utmost respect for for these members of staff. My, my question is around the, the how we support the training and resilience of of our community learning and development staff and thinking about community link workers, you know, really not the easiest job in the world, and yet these people do it brilliantly. Um, and it was just to get a bit of, of uh, a kind of behind the scenes of the of the support that's put in place to to make sure these people, um, members of staff, can can do their jobs as well as they do. Thank you, Linda. I think you've been encouraged by David to try and answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think um, sustainability and that kind of future proof in our service is absolutely key to where, where we're going. So if we're thinking about um, not only supporting the staff now, but thinking about how we develop the staff for tomorrow, if we think about the awards um, and the opportunities that young people are being given to participate in their community, so really thinking about the, the groups that um, Ben was talking about earlier, um, the, the kind of youth forum 
and the, and the way in which that will will take forward um, the four MYSPs that we are um, supporting at the moment, then it's about growing um, the future CLD workforce. Those that are interested in their community, those that want to take an active part are encouraged and supported to do so. And there's a range of awards. So taking part in the youth forum will a will, uh, go towards accreditation for a dynamic use award, for example. I think our current staff, um, we it is tough out there at the moment, and I don't think anybody could would, would say otherwise that in um, the public facing with our young people in our communities, there is a lot of demand, there is a lot of um, desperation, there's a lot of sadness around for families where the 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 they are struggling themselves to manage um, on the day to day bit. So I think coming together as a group is as important as having individual support. Um, I think sharing practice, um, having that opportunity to um, talk to your peers in different ways. So things, development days in schools, the sharing of the uh, work and experience and training through the Youth Work Partnership meetings is as much about sharing that kind of burden of how difficult it life is at the moment. Individually within all of our services, we'll have that kind of individual support for workers. Um, in terms of training, there has been a rollout of the trauma-informed practice training um, that people can that staff are encouraged to do online because I think that helps understand the behaviours that um, the staff are facing each day and helps you to sort of think about how could you approach a situation differently. So that those are the kind of rollout trainings for everybody. More specifically, we are looking at trying to, to grow our own through further education, giving opportunities to some of our staff to obtain um, further qualifications and uh, become the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Councillor Sars. Um, I'm going to move the report at this point, if that's OK with everybody. Um, but in, in moving it, it is important to say that you know, our CLD teams do provide valuable support to individuals, children, young people, families and communities who experience some of the worst outcomes and and have the worst, some of the, the most challenging circumstances in Perth and Kinross. And we encompass a wide range of activities, uh, including parenting classes, youth achievement awards, adult learning, administration of community grant schemes and support for uh, gypsy travellers and those seeking asylum. The report summarises the key achievements in year two of the plan, as well as the very positive feedback that the teams received from Education Scotland as a result of the progress visit conducted in April this year. Not least the PEEP scheme, but not um, limited to that as well. And I think we are all aware that, that, that all these successes are happening in challenging times in terms of budget as well. And I think we, we recognise that and it makes the it makes the achievements even more impressive, actually. And I think it is really important that this committee notes our, our thanks to the members of all these teams who are often working in the, at the very front line of services. So um, please note our thanks there. And I'm going to ask Councillor Frampton to form the second of the report, please. Happy to form the second. Thank you, Councillor Frampton. Any comments on the report? If there are, are you, is your, sorry, sorry, Councillor Shaz, I thought you were trying to say that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Convener. Just um, thanks to all the community learning development staff. It really is that front facing um, community based, often the evenings, the weekends work that um, we quite often come into contact with with uh, members of, of this particular team out and about all over the place. So we, we know, you know, the work that goes in and, and the, I think it's if that service wasn't there, my goodness, we'd soon notice it. So um, thank you to all involved. Thank you, Councillor Shires. Um, can we agree and approve the report, please? Thank you very much.
Um, we move on to the last paper of the day, which is school terms and holiday dates. And I'm delighted to say, uh, thank you, David. I'm delighted to say we've got Karen Robertson in the room. I don't know if you're saying anything in introduction or whether I'm, no. Um, Sheena, please, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, and a very short introduction in comparison to my last one. Committee will be pleased to hear that this is the standard report seeking approval for school term and holiday dates. Members are asked to note that the proposed pattern of holiday dates generally reflects the existing pattern, and this pattern provides operational and logistical benefits and provides certainty for parents and staff regarding the timing of school holidays. It is to be noted, please, that Good Friday and Easter Monday have been retained as school holidays in Perth and Gross, both in 26 and in 2027. This report also acknowledges that it may be necessary to include additional closure dates if required throughout the school session using the mechanism that is available to us as a local authority to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheena. Uh, first question is from Billy Hearn, please. Thank you very much. Um, in the conclusion on 6.1, it states there that there's commonality with neighbouring councils. In particular, it mentions the October breaks. However, when you go to the um, school terms for 25-26, we differ with Dundee for the October holidays. And when you go to 26-27, we differ for the October holidays with Angus. And in particular, that's going to affect families in the eastern areas of Perth and Kinross, in particular in Vagari, who may have younger kids in primary school in Perth and Kinross, but have um, secondary school um, kids in Dundee. Um, and I just wonder why we've got that variation, because that is going to put a pressure on uh, families with children that are in both local authorities. Uh, thank you, Bailey. And I know Karen will want to to answer, I suspect, I, I know having, being in the giant CT, I know that these discussions are always, and uh, Councillor Shires kn knows it as well, I think that unions and our human resources team try and get the holidays as aligned as possible, and but sometimes that means they're more aligned to Fife and Stirling and Dundee and Angus. I, th I think it's really difficult to get them all, them, them all aligned, but it's a point well made. I don't know, Karen, if you want to, Add anything to that, please. Sorry, Karen, I think your mic. My apologies. Sorry. In terms of just clarity around commonality, and it is referred to earlier within the report, we might not, and we accept we might not get a full commonality across every single break across all of our neighbouring councils, but there is at least an overlap in previous years we have had situations where there has been no overlap whatsoever. I suppose um, part of the, the difficulty is that every individual local authority has its own de decision making uh, mechanisms and structures and local arrangements that they wish to adhere to. There has been quite a bit of consultation previously around particularly the timing of October holidays with those with that term being particularly short and that has been a, a subject of quite significant discussion with our head teacher colleagues and at GNCT. So the, the pattern that Perth and Kinross goes with and sticks with each year is the pattern that's in, in the uh, holiday dates here. The, some of our neighbouring local authorities move from one pattern to another, so that's why they're not matching on every year. But you know, we understand there is still an overlap with, with part of that. Thank you, Karen. Really, Hand. Is there an education reason why they change that? Is you know, to me, it would be quite simple to go where well, all neighbouring authorities will go from the thirteenth of October which appears to be in one year, the majority or the 6th of October, I'm just picking 25, 26. It would just, I don't understand if there's not an education reason why it's not just standard across the local authority. I think it's just different local authorities have different ideas and where it should be. And Karen can only speak for, for Perth and Ken Rose. I bet it's a, it's a point well made though, Bailey Hearn. Councillor Barrett, please. Oops, sorry. That's the wrong mic button. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Camille. I should know by now, honestly. Um, 
it, it's just I've been contacted by parents who are really keen to plan their holidays to ensure their children do attend school when they should be there. Um, but some need to plan well ahead, and particularly if there's a big family celebration coming up. Um, I was wondering to provide further certainty to both parents and staff, instead of doing this every two years, could we have a rolling annual programme of school holiday dates so that next year at this time we would be approving the dates for 2027, 2028 so that people can see ahead what's happening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barrett. Karen, please. Yes, we can certainly consider that. Uh, the only thing that we may come up against is that we will be kind of working on our own because other local authorities, as you'll see from the table, some of them haven't been set. So we would but that's OK, you know, we can do that um, and we could bring that back if that was a request of the committee to bring that on an annual basis. Thank you, Kat. Ashina. There's another consideration in and amongst that, Councillor Barrett, that links to the timing of the SQA exam diet, which we don't always get with that kind of um, advance notice. And so what we wouldn't want to do, of course, is set holidays that then may then find our schools on holiday at points um, with with that. So I think it's an in principle, yes, with a caveat of clarity around um, those dates and how far in advance we can get those. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Cuthbert, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've got my um, Payside Contracts Vice Convener elect hat on. Um, it strikes me that the authorities that use Tayside contracts are Angus and Dundee. And I know that we're really quite out of sync with them. We're far more in sync with Fife. Um, my question really is, um, has any consideration been given to the additional costs that probably arise because we're out of sync with Angus and Dundee? Because obviously they're going to have to bring staff in to manage their staff when Dundee or Angus, they're, they're off on holiday. So I wondered if there'd been any calculation of what that cost was and whether we should actually think about it a bit more carefully. I think that's a really good question as well. I, I, I'm not absolutely sure whether we have any officers here today that can answer on behalf of Tayside contracts. I think it would be unfair of me actually to, unless anybody particularly does want to comment on that to ask, but I think it's a really good question. I think what I would say is convenient and, and given that you're, you're already existing or soon to be involvement with the Tayside contracts board, that if you can ask these questions, I think we'd be really keen to, to hear the answers if that's not putting all the onus back on you. Well, it is putting all the onus back on you, but yeah. But um, if I think it's a, real, a really good question. I don't think we're going to have the answer to that today and for you. I'm just wondering whether we should have that answer before we, we progress in terms of if it's £100,000 extra it's costing to, to batch up with five, but not Angus and Dundee. Perhaps we should be thinking about not doing the, the match up with Angus and Dundee. I'm sorry, not doing the, the five match up, but doing a different one. I think it's a really good question. I, th I think we have the proposed holiday dates in front of us today that have been ag agreed by uh, Jai and CT, not least. So I I'm not keen to d to delay the approval of it, but nonetheless, I think it. I think it's a, a as we move forward. I think that should be a consideration. Um, so I'm keen to to approve them. I'm quite quite happy for you to put an amendment. I'm not approving them if because I, I think you make a great point. But I think in the greater scheme of things, I'm keen to see the dates approved at this point. Yeah, I just think it, it is quite an important thing. If we can make £100,000, I'm just pick, plucking a figure out of the air. But if you think about all the additional costs of having staff in place and having to run things that would otherwise not be run, it could be quite considerable. Anna, I think you do want to come in here. Thank you. Thank you. I think it would... Um, be important to clarify in terms of the contract with Tayside Contracts with each local authority they will be required to provide services for a set number of days just as the holidays are set we are required to provide education for 190 days um, for pupils and 195 days um, for staff but we can certainly seek any further clarity in following this uh, meeting but that would be part of our contracts in terms of what is provided for our school days yeah, thank you, Karen. I mean, I do. So, Councillor Cuthbert, are you to say something further? 
I was just wondering how long it would take to put through to the JNC and see if they were content with moving the dates in, into alignment. Is that a long process? Could it be done before the next meeting? Uh, I think that is a long process. I think you make a great point. I do think, given the points that Councillor Barrett's made about parents needing certainty, I think I think the, the lesser of two evils, if that's the right way of putting it, is to, I would be keen to approve them today and make that consideration in terms of approving future holiday dates. I think you make a great point. I think we need to explore that. And I think if that affects the way we set holidays in the future, I think that's the thing we should do. Um, in the meantime, as I say, I'm keen to approve these holidays. No, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to I, I, this is an important matter, so I'm not trying to, to shut this down here. If, if you, if you want, do you want a five, do you want a 10 minute, five minute recess? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate the points you made, Councillor Cuthbert, genuinely. Can we approve the holidays? Thank you very much. Just a little bit of excitement towards the end of the committee there, but th thank, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, being flippant, thank you very much as as, as always, and I, I mean this sincerely. I think there was a a great range of question and views shared there across all three papers. So thanks very much for that. Um, thanks very much for your attendance, Amber. I hope we haven't scared you too much, and that you'll you'll come back again. And uh, thanks very much for for officers' time as well. Thanks everyone.